fire emergency in the West. Fast moving flames ravaging much of Arizona. Winds fanning the fire, forcing thousands of people to evacuate. This tunnel of fire burning more than 16,000 acres. Warnings in effect for five states tonight. Breaking tonight, the CDC asking the Department of Justice to appeal a judge's ruling that blocks the mask mandate for travel. The Biden administration left the fate of that mandate in the CDC's hands, saying they would appeal if the CDC believes masks on public transit are still necessary. What happens next as cities look at data showing a rise in COVID cases in 33 states. The threat of another indoor mask mandate also looming for some. Mariupol's last stand, the port city holding on as heavy bombs rain down, destroying what's left. Ukrainian fighters still refuse to surrender, many of them sheltering with 1,000 civilians in a steel plant. Plus, the small town to the west forced to dig a mass grave for their dead. Distraught families saying this is a war crime. James Longman and Marcus Moore report from Ukraine tonight. A father's anger, his response to this video of his eight-year-old son put in the back of a police cruiser that has gone viral and raised major concerns. It's a battle over lineage and history, and because of it, members of a tribe were disenrolled. Accusations that at the center of this fight is the need for power. It's always been a, like a family feud, a kind of thing within tribes where the people want the power. It all comes down to the the, the greed and the, the power grab. It's the simple fact that they do not have lineage to Nooksack. Going green again, the reforestation effort in the West to bring back the lush woods after devastating droughts and fires. Where we're standing right now is a success story. This is an example of where the Forest Service has done and got the trees to live and grow. The streaming struggle, subscribers are filing out, a report that sent Netflix stocks tumbling. So what does this mean for you, the viewer? Big changes could be what's up next. Good evening, I'm Monica Sarambi in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with major news on that federal mask mandate. A short time ago, the CDC requested the Department of Justice file an appeal against a federal judge's decision to overturn the mask mandate Monday. In the recommendation to the DOJ, the CDC said it is the agency's continuing assessment that at this time, an order requiring masking on planes and public transportation remains necessary for public health. But at airports, Reports across the country, our teams have seen many people opting to not wear masks. And just yesterday, President Biden said it was up to Americans to decide if they should mask up on planes. The possible whiplash may only add to the confusion in airports across the country. We've seen the videos of people celebrating on planes in the past few days. So what happens now? Our chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vegas, is standing by the White House. But first, Gio Benitez leads us off with more tonight. Tonight, at the request of the CDC, the Justice Department is appealing a federal judge's ruling that overturned its travel mask mandate. The agency saying an order requiring masking in the indoor transportation corridor remains necessary for the public health. It comes as millions of Americans have already dropped masks on planes and public transit. The White House today pressed on whether it will fight to put masks back on. We expect there to be ups and downs in the pandemic, and we certainly want the CDC to continue to have this authority. For now, the White House is recommending travelers still wear masks. COVID response coordinator Dr. Ashish Jha had called the decision by that judge to end the mandate deeply disappointing, joining a chorus of public health experts voicing concern that the move undermines the authority of the CDC. This change in policy sets a really challenging precedent for how public health is done in this country. A single judge overturning a mandate driven by public health professional means that we're unnecessarily putting many people at risk. For now, Americans on the move are navigating a confusing maze of mask rules. No masks needed on flights, but if you land in Philadelphia, you'll need one inside the airport. And now that I'm here in Philadelphia, there is an indoor mask mandate, yet I'm seeing so many people without masks, so it's really quite confusing. After you leave the Philly airport, you can ditch the mask for a bus or train, but put it back on again inside a restaurant or store. New York is keeping the mask mandate in place at JFK, LaGuardia, and on public transit. Governor Hochul today warning about rising infections fueled by new Omicron subvariants. 
We're not panicking about this. We're not changing. But we also want to make sure that we're hard, so smart about this. Gio Benitez joins us now. The CDC tonight has asked for an appeal. The DOJ has filed notice already. It will appeal. But in the meantime, Gio, does anything change for Americans traveling right now? So, Mona, at this point, nothing changes for Americans traveling until this is decided by a federal appeals court. And let me read to you what the CDC is saying tonight, that it believes this is a lawful order well within the CDC's legal authority to protect public health. So a lot of concern tonight about what this means for the future. And Gio, we saw the push by airlines to end this mask mandate quickly after the judge's ruling. This appeal, though, puts airlines and their employees in a tricky spot. Absolutely. Look, airlines did not want their employees to be sort of like police officers enforcing these rules. And so they were very happy when this happened. They had been pushing this for weeks and weeks and weeks. So we saw all those images of airline workers and airport employees taking down those signs because they really did not want to be the ones enforcing this rule. Now it's going to be really interesting if this is reinstated. What happens now? Uh, will they be able to enforce this and will people be going through the airports without masks anyway. Lots of questions tonight, Mona. We will have to wait and see. Gio Benitez, thank you. Let's bring in ABC News Chief White House Correspondent Cecilia Vega. Cecilia, what's driving the CDC's decision to appeal this ruling right now, and what kind of tightrope is the White House walking on when it comes to public opinion on this issue? Yeah, Mona, the public opinion factor is a really big deal. Uh, the White House keenly aware of that, especially heading into the midterms, which are now not that far away. But in terms of the CDC, look, this is a really big deal for them and, and for this White House, in that, for that matter. Um, the White House and administration officials firmly believe that scientists, that the CDC needed the next two weeks to pour over data to make an informed decision about Americans and mask mandates on airplanes, on travel, that this was a decision that needed to be based on the data. This isn't just about what's happening right now, though. For this White House, for the CDC, this really is about establishing precedent. The White House, the administration, Mona, they want the CDC now and in the future, not just for this COVID pandemic, for in the future, though, to be the agency that makes informed health decisions for the American public based on science, they say. Cecilia Vega in Washington, thank you. Now to the escalating war in Ukraine. The U.S. and its allies are rushing to arm Ukrainian forces as Russia ramps up its assault on the east. Ukraine's port city of Mariupol remains a must-win for Russia. They have been demanding the surrender of Ukrainian fighters that are sheltering with 1,000 civilians inside a steel plant. The Ukrainian commander of those forces speaking to the Washington Post saying, we are probably facing our last days, if not hours. Russia warning that they could deploy nuclear weapons at hypersonic Sonic speeds. Vladimir Putin saying those who threaten Russia should think twice. James Longman is just 15 miles from the Russian front in Dnipro, Ukraine, with the very latest. Tonight, Ukrainian fighters clinging on to their last stronghold in Mariupol. A commander inside the Avostal steel factory telling the Washington Post the Russians outnumber defenders by 10 to 1. We're probably facing our last days, if not hours, says Serhii Voina. He vowed to fight on, not giving in to yet another Russian demand to surrender today. More than a thousand civilians are said to be sheltering here. Video posted by the far-right Azov battalion, who are fighting with the Ukrainians, reportedly shows civilians inside the factory. Russia says these people are being used as human shields. But the video, which ABC News can't independently verify, shows mothers <laughs> pleading for help to get their children to safety and saying supplies are running low. It's not just those in the plant in danger. Mariupol's mayor says about 100,000 civilians remain trapped in the city. Yet another effort failing today to create humanitarian corridors for them to leave. Many attempted to board buses today, but it's unknown if they're able to get out. The fighting across eastern Ukraine is ramping up. Undated video circulating on social media shows a devastating attack on Mykolaiv as Russia opens a new offensive to take the Donbass region, the front now 300 miles long. This highway basically leads you straight to the Russians, about 15 miles down this road. And all the way down it, there are these towns and villages which have been almost entirely evacuated. I mean, there's no one here. They're deserted. And all the men have basically gone to fight. They've headed to the front line to defend their homes from Russia's uh, second advance. Only a few families remain. 
like Valentina's. Do you think the Russians will come? We hope the Ukrainians will destroy them, she says. And lots of men from this town have gone to fight, right? My brother-in-law is one of the members of Azov in Mariupol. Are you in touch with him? It must be impossible. You can't even communicate. Two weeks ago, he called his wife and said he was alive. And in an unmistakable message tonight, Russia test launching a new intercontinental ballistic missile that would be the latest addition to the Kremlin's nuclear arsenal. President Vladimir Putin saying it will make those who threaten Russia think twice. Meeting with his senior defense officials today, President Biden made no mention of the Russian missile test, but did praise the strength of the Ukrainian people. I was deeply involved in what was going on in Ukraine, and I knew they were tough and proud, but I tell you what, they're tougher and more proud than I thought. James Longman joins us now from Dnipro in eastern Ukraine. James, the president saying the U.S. has to be ready and adapt to everything that's happening in the world? That's right, Mona. He spoke to his uh, advisers this afternoon. He said he sees a need for adaptation in response to Vladimir Putin's invasion and also to constantly adapt to changes around the world as a result. And I think he's also keen to stress that the United States' help to Ukraine, their military aid, might change if the situation here changes. Mona. All right, James Longman, thank you. To the west is Borodanka, Ukraine, a small town so devastated by the war, they were forced to dig a mass grave for their dead. We want to warn you that the video you're about to see is disturbing. Our Marcus Moore is there and joins us now. Marcus, what are you seeing there right now, and what are loved ones of those found telling you? Well, Mona, it's a very upsetting scene there in uh, Borodyanka where th uh, we saw a mass grave that had been dug up where they were exhuming the bodies of several people who were buried there. And what we heard from, from locals is that they were buried there for a couple of reasons. Number one, there was no electricity um, in the area and uh, the morgue couldn't keep the, the bodies cool. Also, after the Russian offensive there, a place they had occupied for several weeks. They left it in, um, in ruins. And uh, people said that there were so many bodies uh, in, on the streets there that uh, there was no room for any more bodies in the morgues. So um, these are people who were then uh, buried uh, in these mass graves. And um, they have been exhumed as the investigation into potential war crimes unfolds. And at some point, uh, the hope is that the people who, who passed away, uh, that they will receive proper burials. And Mona, we're talking about um, a 14-year-old girl whose body was exhumed today. Her friends told us that she was, was killed after uh, she was evacuating from Bucha. She passed through this town and one of the traffic circles, and she was shot and went to the hospital, uh, but sadly uh, passed away from her injuries. And we also met um, a woman whose 34-year-old son was killed, she said, simply walking across the street. So uh, a very emotional day today and an upsetting scene there uh, in that town. Definitely an unbelievable scene that you just painted for us. But what is the overall scope of the damage in Bordanka? Well, it is, it's pretty breathtaking. There are, pretty much the entire town has sustained some bit of damage. They have high-rise apartment buildings that have been hit by rockets. Uh, today they are charred. We saw the debris there and the devastation. And there are homes that have also been leveled and businesses that no longer exist. And th the belief is that there are still people who are trapped underneath the rubble of some of those buildings who have yet to be found. And Marcus, from the devastation that you described to the, to the overall loss, do people living there view what's happening as a war crime? Oh, they, they, they absolutely do, Amona, and uh, they reinforce the point that these were innocent people. And uh, they are saying that these were everyday people, innocent civilians who were targeted, and so they very much believe that this was uh, a war crime. And they want the world to see what we saw today, these the mass graves and those bodies being exhumed. The uh, police department, the, the criminal unit of the Kyiv region uh, police, uh, they will be examined examining those bodies and trying to determine how each and every single person died as they pursue these claims of war crimes against the Russians. Marcus Moore on the ground in Borodanka. Thank you so much for that report.
next to the growing danger from wildfires in Arizona tonight. The tunnel fire exploding in northern Arizona, burning dozens of structures, and tonight it is threatening hundreds more. Kaylee Hartung reports. Tonight, outside Flagstaff, Arizona, the tunnel fire is out of control, already forcing hundreds of families to flee. We have 45 minutes, and then and all I grabbed was animals and a laundry bag of dirty clothes. The fire nearly tripling in size overnight to 26 square miles. We've lost 25 structures, so we don't want to lose any more. And they still are assessing, so there may, that, that, that number may go up. Authorities receiving frantic calls for help. Winds gusting over 50 miles an hour, grounding firefighting aircraft. The flames reaching 100 feet high in spots. When we're talking flame lengths upwards of 100 plus feet, there's really no piece of aviation or equipment that uh, is going to be able to slow that down or stop it. The fire closing a stretch of US 89. Multiple fires now burning in the hot, dry southwest. The Cook's Peak fire burning thousands of acres in New Mexico. We are in April yeah. and there are fires here all over the place. Is this the new normal? Um, on a dry year like this, it, it sure appears to be. I've seen, you know, spring fires before, but not this many. Highly trained technical teams and resources now coming to Arizona from as far as Washington and Oregon to help. And Kaylee joins us from Arizona. Kaylee, any word on the cause of the fire there? Well, Mona, fire investigators are on the scene trying to determine the cause. And there is another weather system expected to move into the area later this week, likely Friday, and bring with it even more strong winds. Mona. Kaylee Hartung, thank you. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' ongoing battle with the Walt Disney Company, ABC News' parent company, continues early today. The Florida Senate, Senate voting to strip Disney of its special district status. All of this due to the fallout between the company and the governor over what critics call the Don't Say Gay Bill. ABC's Victor Okendo is tracking this all for us in Florida. Tonight, at the urging of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, the Republican-controlled state Senate voting to strip the Walt Disney Company of the special status, granting it self-governing privileges in Walt Disney World and the surrounding areas. 24 yeas, 15 nays, Mr. President. So the bill passes. The move is an effort to punish Disney for publicly opposing Florida's so-called Don't Say Gay law, which restricts how teachers can discuss LGBTQ issues in the classroom. Governor DeSantis has lashed out at corporate America for attacking the law. This state is governed by the interests of the people of the state of Florida. It is not based on the demands of California corporate executives. Disney CEO Bob Chapek at first took a neutral stance on the controversial law. Then, after protests from some Disney employees, Chapek denouncing the legislation. Disney releasing a statement saying, Our goal as a company is for this law to be repealed by the legislature or struck down in the courts. That didn't sit well with DeSantis, who this week announced the state legislature would move to strip Disney of its ability to govern itself in Florida. They also will be considering termination of all special districts that were enacted in Florida prior to 1968, and that includes the Reedy Creek Improvement District. <laughs> The district was carved out in 1967 in a deal negotiated by Walt Disney and his family. It allows Disney to provide its own services like firefighting and waste disposal and avoid many local regulations and taxes. But tonight, one top Florida Republican tweeting, Disney is a guest in Florida. Today, we remind them. Disney World, also the biggest single-site employer in the state. Democrats today denouncing DeSantis. This bill is a knee-jerk reaction and a political stunt, which is short-sighted and not well thought out. Also raising concerns, local communities who have benefited from Florida's arrangement with Disney, they may have to administer these public services themselves and pay for them too. They could become responsible for up to a billion dollars of debt. The mayor of Orange County saying his eye is on unfunded cost shifts to local governments. Victor joins us now. Victor, can you tell us what comes next? Mona, the Florida House is scheduled to vote on this tomorrow. Governor DeSantis is expected to sign. There is no comment from the Walt Disney Company tonight. And keep in mind, this is the largest private employer in the state. Some 20 million people visit Walt Disney World every single year. Mona? Victor Okendo, thank you.
A gruesome murder of a mother in New York City has officers wanting to talk to a man they hope can provide some information on the victim's final moments. Plus, police disclosing a threat via text to her husband. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has this report. Tonight, authorities are looking at this surveillance video, part of their investigation showing a person dragging a duffel bag down the street. 51-year-old Orsaya Gall's body was found in a duffel bag on the side of the road near Queens Park Saturday morning. Police following a blood trail back to her house. Investigators say Gall was stabbed some 60 times in her home, one of her sons upstairs. Her older son and husband out of town looking at colleges. Neighbors shocked by the horrific murder. Never expected anything like that to happen. She was a lovely lady. Always very attentive to her family, her kids, just an amazing person. Police say the killer sent text messages from her phone to her husband. One reading, your whole family is next. And more possible clues in her phone. Investigators saying she had the numbers for three men. Police want to talk with one of them who they say was familiar with Gall's home and may have had a way to get in. The NYPD now pouring through evidence, trying to track down Gall's killer. And they're just putting the duck, their ducks together, if you will. All the evidence, DNA, cell phones, um, fingerprints, whatever's at the crime scene. Eva Pilgrim joins us now. Eva, based on this new information, is there any indication that the victim may have no, known her killer? Uh, Mona, investigators think that Gall may have known the killer. There was no sign of forced entry into this home. Crime Stoppers is now offering a $3,500 reward for any information that may lead to an arrest. Mona. All right, Eva Pilgrim, thank you. And we come back. The father of that eight-year-old captured on video at the back of a police car speaks out. Jada Pinkin Smith speaking out for the first time publicly since her husband's infamous slap. But up next, a heated battle over lineage and housing rights on sovereign tribal land. How one family says they're unjustly being ousted from their homes and their ancestral land. Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. We have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pat. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. The hottest news in daytime are happening right here. We talk about things on this show that people don't talk about. That I can't wait to see. Honest takes from strong women. We need all hands on deck and we need it right now. This is the time to speak out. Unafraid to get real. We stick by our points of view. We're all seeing it differently and that's the beauty of The View. And that's why the most watched number one daytime talk show is The View. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put your life at risk. the darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's why we do it. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted.
and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Imagine spending your whole life connected to a community, even participating in local government affairs, and then one day being told you were not only no longer welcome, but that you and your entire family were no longer recognized by them. Our Mireya Villarreal traveled to Washington state and looked into the tribal disenrollment one family claims is unjustly leaving them without a home and identity. 15 miles south of the Canadian border, cedar trees line the winding roads of Deming, Washington. In the distance, snow still tops the mountain peaks as spring ushers in the warmer weather. Below, the Nooksack River glistens. Its watershed considered native land for some 2,000 people who were part of the Nooksack Indian tribe. Where does your father live over here? So his house is straight down here. Oh, okay. yeah. Michelle Roberts expected to own her home by the end of this year. But the Nooksack tribe is trying to evict her because she's part of the 306 group. The baskets my grandmother weaved. 306 people from the Rabang family who were officially disenrolled from the Nooksack tribe in 2016. Having such a large family that it didn't sit well with them. It's always been a, like a family feud, a kind of thing within tribes where the people want the power. It all comes down to the, the, the greed and the, the power grab. Michelle officially became a member of Nooksack in 1983, at one point serving on the tribal council. All of that taken away when a former tribal chair questioned her family's lineage to Nooksack and with the help of other council members, they began the process of disenrolling Michelle and the other Rabangs. Have you been able to gather the documents to try and re-enroll and try and prove that you belong to this tribe? I, we have the documents, yes. And it proves that you are Nooksack? In our eyes, yeah. Did you ever think that you would have to do all of this just to no, not at all. When your grandparents say, you know, you're from a certain area, this is who you are, this is where you belong, you believe them. And um, having to find documents to prove that, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of demeaning. <laughs> the UN even weighed in, expressing concerns over the evictees' human rights and due process. They urged the U.S. government to step in and halt the evictions. The federal government responding, saying they found the tribe to be in compliance with its procedures. Where would you guys go? We don't know. I don't know at this point. Um, we're going to be struggling if we, if it gets to that point. But Michelle is hopeful the newly elected Nooksack tribal chair, Rosemary LeClaire, will hear them out. We're hoping that she will sit down and actually look at our documents with open eyes. Um, this. That generation seems to be more open to put a closure to this. We need to start healing. Healing may be hard to come by. Rosemary LeClaire supports the disenrollment of the Rabang family. In her first ever interview, she says this has nothing to do with power and everything to do with preservation. I don't want to string along hope. That's not who I am. I need to defend the Nooksack people. I need to defend my children and to portray the truth that Nooksack were humble people. And there's not much that we have to be offering even our own people. The little resources that we do have, we need to make sure is secured for our future. Is this a war between families, families in no. this situation? It's the simple fact that they do not have lineage to Nooksack. Tribal disenrollment isn't unique to Nooksack. According to some estimates, some 10,000 people have been affected by disenrollment nationwide. It's the rise of tribal self-determination coupled with uh, an influx of gaming money contributed to a lot of political pressure to create disenrollment. The vast majority of tribes did not do this. They did not um, go down that road. 
And yet, Nooksack did. One of Nooksack's casinos shut down and the other isn't a cash cow, so there's no money to really fight over. But those who no longer belong to a tribe can lose access to tribal resources like health care, education grants, and housing. Nooksack is one of the 573 federally recognized tribes who operates as a sovereign nation. The federal government has little power to meddle in internal affairs like disenrollment. And for Santana Bang, what stings the most is the feeling of being stripped of her identity. It's a direct attack on who I am. Technically, on paper, I'm not native. Santana Rabang and her grandfather, Robert Rabang, were also disenrolled. Santana now lives in Lumi, the tribe where her mother is from. But she's not a member of Lumi either because she doesn't meet blood quantum requirements there. Blood quantum was imposed by the U.S. government in the early 1900s as a means to define and limit citizenship within Indian tribes. It's still being used today to measure the amount of tribal blood in a person's ancestry. Blood quantum isn't how we identify as indigenous. It's my connection to the land and the knowledge that I carry. It's not the amount of blood that I have in me. It's the fact that it's there and, and lives through me is all that matters to me, but so, I'm not enrolled anywhere. This neighborhood is where Santana grew up learning Nooksack traditions. Go ahead. Oh, my grandchildren. And since Robert is no longer considered Nooksack, he's also facing eviction. He's fighting to stay to preserve his mother's legacy, the woman who was known for weaving baskets out of cedar. It's been really stressful. It just hurts. All these people were our friends when they first came up here. Now they're all turning their backs like you. <sighs> Which, you know, it's really difficult. I don't want to give up my, uh, my mom's fight. I'm, I'm fighting for her. It could get really ugly because I'm not leaving here. I think there is a deeper concern and heartache, really because now they might be losing their homes. They are perceiving the fact that they, because they are not able to enroll in Nooksack, that they have nothing, and that's not the case. They have options to housing, just like all people have options to housing. They just do not have options to housing with Nooksack. Rosemary says housing is hard to come by, and that's why they're pushing hard to make the Rebangs leave. She says about 60 people who are Nooksack await housing. Some are in this house that's now a homeless shelter. We're not saying that they don't belong anywhere else. We encourage them to find their lineage to where they do belong. For Robert, that means he'll likely move to Canada, where he already has a home. Santana's hopes is to join the Lumi tribe. Discussions to revise the Lumi tribe's basis for enrollment would mean she wouldn't have to prove the amount of blood she has, but rather her connection to the land. Our thanks to Maria. Still ahead here on Prime, rapper Aesop Rocky arrested at LAX in connection with a shooting. We have those details. It was a terrible day for Netflix with their stocks plunging. But where do things stand in the streaming wars? And millions around the country celebrating on this 420. We take a look at where things stand in the nationwide efforts to legalize marijuana by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day, happy 85th birthday, George Takei. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. 
What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. Is that the gun? That's not the gun. What is it? I won't ask you again, then. Are you a Nazi? <laughs> the deeper you go into the black market, you put people to your life at risk. The darker it gets. Why hasn't anyone come out and spoken? It's about the money. That's all we do. Trafficked. New episodes Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. I was badly hit, and there you were. <laughs> you helped to save my life. You were in dire straits. You actually had a body bag on the underside of your stretcher. Our go-to drug was fentanyl. Fentanyl. Now, at home, the same man who had used fentanyl to save me ultimately ended up on the same path of addiction many others have taken. Before you know it, it's spiraled out of control. America is being poisoned with fentanyl and we don't even know. ABC News Live presents Poisoned, America's Fentanyl Crisis, the powerful series streaming free on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app, download it now. I risk my life. If I was caught, they would have put a bullet in my head. That would have been one of the most deadly acts of domestic terrorism ever in the United States. He put himself in jeopardy for us. Welcome back. They call this 420 Day. To be blunt, the holiday is for marijuana enthusiasts all across the world. But legalizing weed is no longer a fringe issue, and a high number of states are moving to do so. Let's take a look by the numbers. 18 states and the District of Columbia have legalized the recreational use of marijuana since 2012. A handful more are expected to follow suit soon. 19 more states permit it for medical use. Another 13 states and the U.S. Virgin Islands have decriminalized its use. April 21st, tomorrow, is when legal cannabis is rolling out in New Jersey. Ten stores will be open for business. The state missed today's party by one day, and that was by design. Seven in ten American adults think the use of cannabis should be legal, according to our friends at 538. That's two times as many who thought so 20 years ago. And one other note, $799. That's a price per pound of marijuana in Colorado, where while other products have taken a hit, because of inflation, that price is near its lowest level on record, 11%. That's how much the price of marijuana, flour, edible, and vaping products dropped from last year, according to Headset, a cannabis analytics company tracking prices across six states. In San Francisco, after a two-year pandemic pause, the cloud of smoke is back over Hippie Hill tonight as 420 celebrations are back. And we still have a ton to get to here on Prime. The deadly shooting at an embassy in D.C. and why Hall of Famer Jerry West is upset about his portrayal in a popular TV series out right now. And he's not the only famous Laker. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCNews.com. With so much at stake in our world right now, we wanted to thank you for your trust, and for making ABC News America's number one news. And thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? 
GMA3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Russia's defense ministry releasing new video Wednesday claiming to show an airstrike on Ukrainian facilities. ABC News has not independently verified that claim. Ukrainian forces in hard-hit Mariupol fear losing control of the city in just days. Ukraine's President Zelensky saying his troops defending the Mariupol steelworks while allegedly sheltering about a thousand civilians won't surrender. Russian President Vladimir Putin is praising the launch of the new nuclear-capable intercontinental ballistic missile, saying it should make those who threaten Russia think twice. A senior U.S. defense official condemning Putin's rhetoric given the war in Ukraine, though the Pentagon called the test routine. In Washington, D.C., a man shot and killed by Secret Service agents. Officials say he was smashing windows at the Peruvian ambassador's house. Metro Police Chief Robert Conti. Once the officers encountered this individual in the back, they learned that this individual had smashed out several windows to the backside of this residence. Uh, this person was holding a metal stake. The officers fired those tasers. Uh, they, they did not take effect. And as these uh, weapons did not take effect, ultimately the officers ended up pulling their service weapons, firing shots, and this person is now deceased. Jada Pinkett Smith publicly addressing for the first time her husband Will Smith's assault on Chris Rock at the Oscars. A brief statement appearing at the beginning of a Red Table talk show about Smith slapping Rock after the comedian made a joke about her. It says, quote, considering all that has happened in the last few weeks, the Smith family has been focusing on deep healing. Some of the discoveries around our healing will be shared at the table when the time calls. Will Smith resigned from the Academy after the slap. He was then banned from the Academy Awards for 10 years. The Harlem-born rapper known as ASAP Rocky in police custody in connection with a shooting in California. Los Angeles police arrested the recording artist, whose real name is Rakeem Mayers, at Los Angeles International Airport. The 33-year-old is the boyfriend of the singer Rihanna. He's suspected in a shooting in Hollywood back in November. Cops say Mayers argued with another person and then fired a handgun at the victim. He and two other men allegedly ran away from the scene. The victim treated for minor injuries. Millions of people online have seen what is y'all doing? and are reacting to this video of an eight-year-old child stopped by Syracuse police. The boy screaming and sobbing while being placed in the back of a police cruiser by three officers after they say he stole a bag of chips from a local store. If he stole some chips, I'll pay for them. Kenneth Jackson recorded the incident and spoke with GMA overnight. I have to because at that moment I'm looking around and there's no one out there besides myself. It was his video that prompted a passionate online debate about what the appropriate course of action should be in this situation. We have a policing problem when it comes to police in the community. In a statement, the Syracuse mayor says what occurred demonstrates the continuing need for the city to provide support to our children and families and to invest in alternative response options to assist our officers. The officers later dropped off the young boy to his father, who at the time said the officers were friendly. But after seeing the video, wants to file a complaint with police. I I want them to pay for what he did to my son. Today is my child. Tomorrow, it might be someone else's child. Syracuse police say the incident is under investigation and they cannot comment. Jerry West believes he's been wronged and wants it made right. The NBA icon and L.A. Lakers former executive and his legal team sending a letter to HBO and Winning Times producer Adam McKay 
demanding a retraction and an apology for what West is calling a baseless and malicious assault on his character in the hit TV series depicting the rise of the Lakers dynasty in the 1980s. In the letter obtained by ESPN, West lawyers allege that Winning Time falsely and cruelly portrays Mr. West as an out-of-control, intoxicated rageaholic, saying that bears no resemblance to the real man. Newly released 911 calls shedding light into the tragic moments surrounding the death of Pittsburgh Steelers quarterback Dwayne Haskins. Hi, I'm calling because my husband he was stuck on the side of the highway. He, didn't get, he had to go walk and get gas, and then he said he was returning to the car on the highway. Um, we were on the phone. He said he was going to call me back. I think he was putting the gas in, and I kept calling and kept calling. He wasn't answering. Eventually, after 10 minutes of calling the phone, eventually cut off. All right, so I don't want you to panic, but I'm going to be honest with you. Uh, you do have an incident on the highway, but I can't confirm if that's your husband or not. Authorities say he was struck and killed by two vehicles while walking across a major South Florida highway. The incident remains under investigation. Now to the news that sent Netflix stock tumbling in the past 24 hours after a brutal report showing the streaming service has lost 200,000 subscribers so far this year. The first time that's happened in a decade. That could lead to big changes for the company and its users. ABC News' Will Reeve has the story. Tonight, it's Netflix and Cell. The streaming giant down a whopping 35% on Wall Street today after announcing its first quarterly subscriber loss in over a decade. Netflix saying more than 200,000 subscribers left the service in the first three months of the year. The expectation was that Netflix was going to have a bad quarter in terms of subscriber growth, but it was even worse than what anyone was expecting. Netflix is home to shows like Squid Game. Bridgerton. You were the bane of my existence object of all my desires and the upcoming penultimate season of stranger things see you on the other side on the other side but even these hits may not be enough to fend off stiff competition from other streaming services there are just so many players out there right now and before this netflix was really the primary player it had the biggest reach globally but of course that is being threatened right now and now observers are asking if viewers will have to binge watch their favorite netflix show with ads in between it's something ceo reed hastings hasn't ruled out allowing consumers who would like to have a lower price and are advertising tolerant um, get what they want makes a lot of sense. So that's something we're looking at now. Our thanks to Will Reeve. For more on this, I'm joined by Eric Cohn, executive editor of IndieWire. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Eric. How's it going? Good. Thanks for having me. Well, for so long, Netflix has been the dominant player in the streaming world. So I have to ask, is this subscriber loss a sign that the competition in the streaming wars is finally taking a toll on Netflix and that there may be a limit on how many services people can sign up for? Well, we knew that this was heading this direction for years. It's been sort of a slow-mo march to the inevitable situation where Netflix is facing all the subscribers it's going to get and a real problem in that what with both inflation and, and the, the competition from other services, people know that they have options here. You don't have Netflix and nothing else. So this subscriber drop was absolutely inevitable. And the real question is, what can Netflix do to bring some more money into the door and make this service more cost effective to people who realize that they don't have to be tied to this service forever? And we've seen several companies that thrive during the pandemic, like Zoom and Peloton, also take a tumble as their growth has slowed. How much did the pandemic skew how companies like Netflix were performing as we were all forced to stay at home and change our behavior in so many ways for the past two years? Well, I think at first the pandemic was actually a silver lining for Netflix in the sense that people were at home, they were streaming more than ever, and their numbers jumped up significantly in that respect. But little by little, the economic toll took hold. And this is not a cheap service. Let's remember, people are spending between $15 and $20 a month. That's a big part of a lot of people's income. So they really have to ask themselves, what am I paying for at the end of the day? Does this particular service offer something that can't be replaced by another one? So, Eric, what do you think this means for the future of Netflix? They forecast that they could lose even more subscribers in the coming months. Are changes that they are discussing, like an ad-supported version, the way to get more people back? 
I think that an ad supported version is going to result in a cheaper option and that absolutely is a way to get more people back. It's also an opportunity for Netflix to get into certain parts of the world that it hasn't really been able to penetrate, like Africa, for example, where you could get to more subscribers that couldn't necessarily afford this service before. But I also think that we're going to see a lot of different experiments with Netflix in terms of what kind of a content business it's really in. Already we're seeing an, an interest in gaming, for example. So I think you could see more experiments along those lines. But it's going to be a real open question in the months ahead. How does Netflix make itself even more appealing to people? Because at this point, people know that they don't have to do Netflix or nothing. And speaking of things that they're contemplating, Netflix also discussed how much they're losing from users who are sharing passwords, which they may try to crack down on. Any danger of that backfiring, given that so many people have gotten used to sharing their passwords with their family and their friends? Yeah, I mean, it's been sort of this open secret for a while that everyone shares their Netflix passwords. It's, it's how everyone sort of adapted to the streaming space and got around the the need to, to be able to access this service, whether or not they could all afford it all at once. So cracking down is definitely going to create a backlash. The question is, how do people adapt? If you can't do this, do you give up on the service? Do you pay more? How badly do you need Netflix in your life? And I think that question is going to be answered very quickly in the months ahead. And finally, Eric, what kind of impact do you think that this will have on the creative community and getting more shows and movies on streaming platforms, Netflix and other players have poured billions into content, but any concern for Hollywood that could slow down if customers grow, customer growth doesn't continue? Well, look, Netflix has been the biggest disruptive studio in Hollywood in modern history. I have a, a Roma poster over my, oh, the, my shoulder as I'm speaking. And the, the kinds of uh, material that Netflix has financed over the years is the kind of stuff that we haven't really seen Hollywood throwing support behind uh, in, in, in tra traditional studio context for a very long time. So I think the real question is, is Netflix going to continue to feel comfortable throwing that kind of financial investment behind sort of riskier investments if the subscribers aren't showing up. And hopefully the answer is yes, but that means they need to figure out how to keep those subscribers coming in. So we'll see. All right, we will definitely see. Eric Cohn, executive editor of IndieWire, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's my pleasure to be here. Finally tonight, when it comes to the devastation out west from the increasing number of wildfires, the process of starting over can be painstakingly slow. That's where the residents of a California town who know the danger of wildfires all too well comes in, repurposing the charred remains of trees to rebuild their town. This while the Forest Service tries to replant and renew forests to help prevent future fires. Kana Whitworth has this in-depth report. This is the sound of slow but steady progress. I see the phoenix rising from the ashes. The burned out remains of tree logs taken away. Young seedlings ready to restore the California forest. A welcome sign for this historic gold rush town of Greenville, turned to ash by the largest single origin fire in California history. We lost Greenville tonight. In August 2021, the Dixie Fire torched nearly 1 million acres, burning for months. In Greenville, nearly every building destroyed. This is what's left of Greenville. That used to be a hair salon right there. This is a town that was built more than 160 years ago and burned down in just 30 minutes. But everyone here survived, and a majority of them plan to rebuild. Primo Castle's home, standing for more than 100 years, completely destroyed. When I break, I don't have to think about it. The massive fire requiring an equally large response to rebuild. Primo, just one of 1,100 residents forced to start over. And there's a lot to be done. It's more than taking hammer to nail. There's serious innovation at work. Randy, a third generation logger, part of that support, turning millions of burned down trees into affordable lumber. We're trying to do what we can. Lumber prices are so high and all this natural resource is going to waste. And, you know, something had to be done. Due to a lack of sawmills in the state, larger mills have been overloaded for years. Unable to process the millions of trees killed in wildfires and historic drought conditions. Acknowledging the value in the materials, this sawmill was the brainchild of people directly impacted by fire and made possible in part through a grant from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. It's so important that California retain the characteristics of rural communities. 
Last year alone, nearly 3 million acres of California forests burned. Homes, communities, generational growth forests wiped off the map. I was here as it was burning. You see those flames are going hundreds of feet into the air, and you see the embers that are flying off those flames, so those can start new fires some five miles away. It's sad to see it now. It's sad for me as well. I mean, it's, uh, it's devastating, the, the amount of destruction that's happened in the last three years. But the trees that survived can't do it alone. If you didn't intervene and replant this area, it would be forever scarred. It would accumulate shrubs, it would accumulate fuel, and then when the next fire came, it would be even larger and more severe. The Forest Service is finding it difficult to keep up with the wildfires. Currently, they're facing a backlog of 1.2 million acres in need of reforestation. Enter the largest seed extractory in the country and the Placerville Nursery. Between July and October, they process thousands of seeds every single day. Those months also coincide with some of the largest fires, leaving national forest geneticists to hike into fire zones and collect cones. It was a little bit stressful, but uh, a feeling of reward, because in a weird way, you're feeling like a hero. You're going there to save a population. Foresters need 7 million seedlings to meet their target of reseeding 30,000 acres a year. That rate, it would take 50 years to catch up with the current backlog. So then will you eventually go plant these? Correct. Where we're standing right now is a success story. It is. So this is the 1992 Cleveland fire. This is an example of where the Forest Service has done the site preparation. We've removed the dead trees that were killed by the fire. We planted, we controlled the competing vegetation and got the trees to live and grow. Forester Dana Walsh says they can't even begin forest reconstruction until the ground is cleared. So it's great to see small communities like Greenville taking matters into their own hands. You have to do something with that wood. And if they're able to productively pull together as a community, use that wood and rebuild their community, that is something that we definitely all want to support. And it's already happening. Primo has used wood burned in his community to build his fence, the first step in coming home. I'll just come down here and sit. Just sit. What do you think about? About how my house is going to look. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Can't wait to see it. Our thanks to Kena. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. That jersey you see was worn during both the Hand of God and Goal of the Century goals, both scored by legendary Argentine soccer superstar Diego Maradona during the 1986 World Cup. It is now up for auction in London. The first bid came in around $5 million and some change. If that's not too rich for your blood, the bidding remains open until May 4th. Count me out. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, more on Mariupol's last stand in Ukraine. And have you been paying attention to the Johnny Depp trial? If not, stay with us. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. The deeper you go into black markets, the darker it gets. Traffic Wednesdays at 9 on National Geographic. He thought he was God. He's now one of the most vilified men in the world. He is the everyman. Zelensky is the Tom Hanks of Ukraine. The 
fact that a little nice Jewish boy is 5'7", is showing up this KGB agent in the Kremlin. What do you say to Americans who see Russia and you not only as a rival, but an unfriendly adversary? Two men at war. Which Vladimir will take over? The world is not going to be the same. Christopher Steele, the guy who picked a fight with two presidents, and he's lived to tell the tale. That now infamous dossier. Supposedly a tape showing prostitutes hired by Donald Trump urinating on a bed. It would be quite a tape if it in fact existed. I said take out the PP tape. It quickly became a question of how much of this was accurate. This is the stuff of movies. A lot of this is the stuff of movies. The story of epic proportions. Phony stuff. It's a bunch of crap. It changed history. I'm Monaco Sarabdi in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. An Ohio doctor has been found not guilty of prescribing fatal doses of fentanyl to 14 critically ill patients. Former intensive care doctor William Hussle faced 14 counts of murder involving patients during his time at a Columbia area, Columbus area hospital. A prosecution witness testifying that he gave patients enough fentanyl to kill an elephant. But the defense claimed he was only providing comfort care. Dr. Hustle still faces 10 malpractice lawsuits. More than six months after the film set shooting that killed cinematographer Helena Hutchins, Rust Movie Productions is now facing consequences. Workplace safety regulators in New Mexico releasing the findings of their months-long investigation, saying the company, quote, demonstrated plain indifference to employee safety and knew that firearm safety procedures were not being followed. The report also claims production managers took limited to no actions to address two misfires on set prior to the fatal shooting. Plus, multiple gun safety complaints from crew members were ignored. In his second day of testimony, actor Johnny Depp took the stand and denied he ever physically assaulted his ex-wife, Amber Heard. The former Pirates of the Caribbean star sued after Heard, who was also an actor, made an indirect reference to those accusations in an op-ed piece she wrote for the Washington Post. During his testimony, Depp said he was the one who suffered physical abuse at the hands of Heard and used drugs and drank alcohol as a way to cope. We turn now to the confusion after a judge overturned the federal mask mandate on airplanes and public transportation. The Biden administration says they will appeal the ruling if the CDC determines there is a public health need. So as COVID cases are on the rise again, could mask mandates return? Here's ABC's Gio Benitez. Tonight, at the request of the CDC, the Justice Department is appealing a federal judge's ruling that overturned its travel mask mandate. The agency saying an order requiring masking in the indoor transportation corridor remains necessary for the public health. It comes as millions of Americans have already dropped masks on planes and public transit. The White House today pressed on whether it will fight to put masks back on. We expect there to be ups and downs in the pandemic, and we certainly want the CDC to continue to have this authority. For now, the White House is recommending travelers still wear masks. COVID response coordinator Dr. Ashish Jha had called the decision by that judge to end the mandate deeply disappointing, joining a chorus of public health experts voicing concern that the move undermines the authority of the CDC. This change in policy sets a really challenging precedent for how public health is done in this country. A single judge overturning a mandate driven by public health professional means that we're unnecessarily putting many people at risk. For now, Americans on the move are navigating a confusing maze of mask rules. No masks needed on flights, but if you land in Philadelphia, you'll need one inside the airport. And now that I'm here in Philadelphia, there is an indoor mask mandate, yet I'm seeing so many people without masks. So it's really quite confusing. After you leave the Philly airport, you can ditch the mask for a bus or train, but put it back on again inside a restaurant or store. New York is keeping the mask mandate in place at JFK, LaGuardia, and on public transit. Governor Hochul today warning about rising infections fueled by new Omicron subvariants. We're not panicking about this, we're not changing, but we also want to make sure that we're hard, so, smart about this. Now to the escalating war in Ukraine. Russia is ramping up its assault on the east, especially on the must-win port city of Mariupol. They have been demanding the surrender of Ukrainian fighters there. Those fighters are currently sheltering with 1,000 civilians inside a steel plant. Our James Longman is just 15 miles from the Russian front in Dnipro, Ukraine, with the very latest. 
Tonight, Ukrainian fighters clinging on to their last stronghold in Mariupol. A commander inside the Avostal steel factory telling the Washington Post the Russians outnumber defenders by 10 to 1. We're probably facing our last days, if not hours, says Serhii Voina. He vowed to fight on, not giving in to yet another Russian demand to surrender today. More than a thousand civilians are said to be sheltering here. Video posted by the far-right Azov battalion, who were fighting with the Ukrainians, reportedly shows civilians inside the factory. Russia says these people are being used as human shields. But the video, which ABC News can't independently verify, shows mothers <laughs> pleading for help to get their children to safety and saying supplies are running low. It's not just those in the plant in danger. Mariupol's mayor says about 100,000 civilians remain trapped in the city. Yet another effort failing today to create humanitarian corridors for them to leave. Many attempted to board buses today, but it's unknown if they're able to get out. The fighting across eastern Ukraine is ramping up. Undated video circulating on social media shows a devastating attack on Mykolaiv as Russia opens a new offensive to take the Donbass region, the front now 300 miles long. This highway basically leads you straight to the Russians, about 15 miles down this road. And all the way down it, there are these towns and villages which have been almost entirely evacuated. I mean, there's no one here. They're deserted. And all the men have basically gone to fight. They've headed to the front line to defend their homes from Russia's uh, second advance. Only a few families remain, like Valentina's. And do you think the Russians will come? We hope the Ukrainians will destroy them, she says. And lots of men from this town have gone to fight, right? My brother-in-law is one of the members of Azov in Mariupol. Are you in touch with him? It must be impossible. You can't even communicate. Two weeks ago, he called his wife and said he was alive. And in an unmistakable message tonight, Russia test launching a new intercontinental ballistic missile that would be the latest addition to the Kremlin's nuclear arsenal. President Vladimir Putin saying it will make those who threaten Russia think twice. Meeting with his senior defense officials today, President Biden made no mention of the Russian missile test, but did praise the strength of the Ukrainian people. I was deeply involved in what was going on in Ukraine. And I knew they were tough and proud, but I tell you what, they're tougher and more proud than I thought. James Longman, thank you. With the 2022 midterm elections gearing up in May, Democrats and Republicans around the country are looking to win back and defend their seats as they battle for control of Congress. And what better case study on that battle than the state of Georgia after it narrowly handed Democrats a majority in the U.S. Senate last year. So joining us now is Atlanta Journal Constitution reporter and author of the new book Flipped, How Georgia Turned Purple and Broke the Monopoly on Republican Power, Greg Bluestein. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Greg. Hey, thank you for having me. Definitely. Well, in your book, you look at the question that is top of mind for many as we enter this next election cycle. Did Georgia, Georgia flip from red to purple, or was the 2020 election cycle just a one-off year with exceptional circumstances and candidates that may have led to the flip? Also, what did you find when examining that question? Yeah, well, we're about to find out if it's just fleeting, if it's a fluke, or if this is more of a permanent change. But we clearly know that Georgia is a state in transition. It, I think it's the most politically divided state in the nation, and I believe it's the biggest test of Donald Trump's influence in the entire country coming up in November. Um, what I learned, one of the things I learned, was this was no um, miracle. This was no overnight success for Democrats. This took years of painstaking work, a different message, and uh, an energizing uh, ability to reach out to voters that felt disconnected, disengaged, disenchanted from the political process with new messages uh, to get them to vote in midterm elections and presidential elections that they bypassed in the past. And Greg, you do a deep dive into the Senate campaigns of Reverend Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff and how they were able to help Democrats win statewide. What do you think both parties took away from those elections? Also, what might you see Republicans doing differently and what will Democrats be trying to replicate in 2022? Well, first thing Democrats will try to replicate is rebuilding that coalition that helped Joe Biden narrowly win in Georgia. And that won't be easy, especially with Donald Trump not on the ballot. What Republicans have working in their favor is uh, that Donald Trump is not out there saying, go vote in a rigged election, right? The mixed messages that Republicans faced here in Georgia and around the country last year, that won't be as much of an issue. But still, the big lie, um, the, all these false conspiracies about 
widespread election fraud. That continues to plague Republicans in a way that we just don't know how it will affect the outcome of the May primary or the November election in Georgia, but we know it's still an ever-present concern for Democrats here. And Democrats, they're facing an uphill battle. Stacey Abrams, who is again running for governor this year and is one of the most notable figures in Georgia's shift because of the work of her grassroots voter registration movement. So what is your view? Can Abrams replicate the voter mobilization strengths that she showed in 2018 and 2020? What kind of test will 2020, 2022 be for her methods and the movement that she's been building? You know, now she is such a national force. I mean, she's raised her profile even, even more so than she was running for governor. Now she's even a bigger name brand among Democratic politicians and the Democratic electorate. But that comes with its risks, too. Um, she is an arch villain in the minds of many Republican voters here in Georgia, and they won't be caught sleeping now, right? They, they know the threat that she poses um, to their election candidacy. So right now, you're already hearing Governor Brian Kemp former Senator David Perdue, who are both battling for the Republican nomination, they're both saying that they're the better candidate to beat her, that only they can defeat her in November. So it's a very interesting message they're trying to push, they're trying to um, uh, promote right now, is that both of them will be the only candidates who can beat Stacey Abrams. Meanwhile, Stacey Abrams can kind of sit back and watch the two of them duke it out and focus on a broader base message, expanding Medicaid, uh, fighting for gun control. These are these are issues that she believes poll really well with the broader Democratic electorate. On the Republican side, we've seen an organized push both across the country and in the state of Georgia to overhaul voting laws in ways that may favor their candidates. Based on what you saw at the grassroots level in your reporting on 2020, do you see this being a large obstacle to the Democratic Party and their efforts to keep Georgia perfect? In a very tight election, it could be a major obstacle. Uh, we saw in Georgia in 2020 just 11,000 or so votes divided Donald Trump and Joe Biden. So if it's an election that close again, then every little bit counts. And these election changes, which call for tighter windows for absentee ballot request forms, which uh, uh, restrict ballot bo drop boxes in many places that had them uh, in abundance in the last election cycle, and that call for other changes. We'll see. We'll see that come into play. And we, we just don't know how much it will. And lastly, Greg, you kind of touched on this earlier. Former President Trump and his efforts to undermine the 2020 vote still looms large over Georgia. And he's looking to make his voice heard in this Georgia race, governor's race this year. How much loyalty does he still command in Georgia Republican circles? And how do you see this battle playing out between Georgia Governor Brian Kemp and former Senator David Perdue? Polls show that Donald Trump is still wildly popular among the Republican electorate here. Uh, not as popular as a few years ago when he was at 90. He's still in 70s in most polls. But the question is whether or not voters who still admire and, and favor the former president will go out and vote for his endorsed candidates. And right now, it's looking really tough for David Perdue, who is behind double digits in, in the polls to Governor Brian Kemp, who Trump has put on the top or at near the top of his revenge list. Um, so David Perdue faces an uphill challenge right now, um, but still, no one's counting David Perdue out because you just don't know the poll, the magnetism of the Donald Trump endorsement right now. We will be watching to see how that all unfolds. Greg Bluestein, thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. His book, Flipped, is available now. And still to come, one of the biggest tennis stars in the world banned from Wimbledon due to the war in Ukraine. Stay with us. It was a scary time. In the 70s, you had multiple bodies showing up in Los Angeles. There were so many murders happening. You had to have a name for it, serial killer. There was a human head in there. This was premeditated evil. You have this clock. This person is going to do this again. It's me against the killer. Who's going to win? We'll see who laughs last. Pow. What came next was unlike anything they had ever seen. America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms.
National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen. She in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24-7, there for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Wimbledon announced a ban on tennis players from Russia and Belarus this year over the invasion of Ukraine. The move causing a huge impact in the tennis world as a Russian and reigning champion of the U.S. Open will not be able to compete on the famous grass courts. It's a change of course for Wimbledon as the event has not banned athletes from specific countries since after World War II when players from Germany and Japan were not allowed to compete. The Kremlin blasted the move calling the ban unacceptable acceptable. Take a look at this nun who tucks her veil under a builder's hat and gets to work manning the hydroelectric plant she built to overcome the electricity cuts in her hometown in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. She works around the clock with a team of nuns and engineers greasing machinery and checking the generator that lights up a covent church, two schools, and a clinic free of charge. Blackouts are a daily disruption in the Congo, a Central African country of around 90 million people. Without the plant, residents would only have electricity two or three days a week for a few hours. Prince Harry opened up about fatherhood and his relationship with his grandmother, the Queen, in an interview with NBC's Today Show. The couple visited the 95-year-old monarch on their way to the Netherlands to attend the Invictus Games. Harry is founder and patron of the international sports competition for wounded military veterans. He also said he is unsure if he will make her upcoming Platinum Jubilee celebration. And for now, the U.S. is where he feels at home. Imagine spending your whole life connected to a community, even participating in local government affairs, and then one day being told that you were not only no longer welcome, but that you and your entire family no longer are recognized by them. Our Mireya Villarreal traveled to Washington state and looked into the tribal disenrollment one family claims is unjustly leaving them without a home and identity. 15 miles south of the Canadian border, cedar trees line the winding roads of Deming, Washington. In the distance, snow still tops the mountain peaks as spring ushers in the warmer weather. Below, the Nooksack River glistens. Its watershed considered native land for some 2,000 people who were part of the Nooksack Indian tribe. Where does your father live over here? So his house is straight down here. Oh, okay. yeah. Michelle Roberts expected to own her home by the end of this year. But the Nooksack tribe is trying to evict her because she's part of the 306 group. The baskets my grandmother weaved. 306 people from the Rabang family who were officially disenrolled from the Nooksack tribe in 2016. Having such a large family that it didn't sit well with them. It's always been a, like a family feud, a kind of thing within tribes where the people want the power. It all comes down to the 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 greed and the, the power grab. Michelle officially became a member of Nooksack in 1983, at one point serving on the tribal council. All of that taken away when a former tribal chair questioned her family's lineage to Nooksack, and with the help of other council members, they began the process of disenrolling Michelle and the other Rabangs. Have you been able to gather the documents to try and re-enroll and try and prove that you belong to this tribe? I, we have the documents, yes. And it proves that you are Nooksack? In our eyes, yeah. Did you ever think that you would have to do all of this just to... No, not at all. When your grandparents say, you know, you're from a certain area, this is who you are, this is where you belong, you believe them. And um, having to find documents to prove that, 
you know, it's, it's, it's kind of demeaning. <laughs> The UN even weighed in, expressing concerns over the evictees' human rights and due process. They urged the U.S. government to step in and halt the evictions. The federal government responding, saying they found the tribe to be in compliance with its procedures. Where would you guys go? We don't know. I don't know at this point. Um, we're going to be struggling if we, if it gets to that point. But Michelle is hopeful the newly elected Nooksack tribal chair, Rosemary LeClaire, will hear them out. We're hoping that she will sit down and actually look at our documents with open eyes. Um, this, that generation seems to be more open to put a closure to this. We need to start healing. Healing may be hard to come by. Rosemary LeClaire supports the disenrollment of the Rebank family. In her first ever interview, she says this has nothing to do with power and everything to do with preservation. I don't want to string along hope. That's not who I am. I need to defend the Nooksack people. I need to defend my children and to portray the truth that Nooksack were humble people. And there's not much that we have to be offering even our own people. The little resources that we do have, we need to make sure is secured for our future. Is this a war between families? Families in no. this situation? It's the simple fact that they do not have lineage to Nooksack. Tribal disenrollment isn't unique to Nooksack. According to some estimates, some 10,000 people have been affected by disenrollment nationwide. It's the rise of tribal self determination coupled with. Uh, an influx of gaming money contributed to a lot of political pressure to create disenrollment. The vast majority of tribes did not do this. They did not um, go down that road. And yet, Nooksack did. One of Nooksack's casinos shut down and the other isn't a cash cow, so there's no money to really fight over. But those who no longer belong to a tribe can lose access to tribal resources like health care, education grants, and housing. Nooksack is one of the 573 federally recognized tribes who operates as a sovereign nation. The federal government has little power to meddle in internal affairs like disenrollment. And for Santana Rabang, what stings the most is the feeling of being stripped of her identity. It's a direct attack on who I am. Technically, on paper, I'm not native. Santana Rabang and her grandfather, Robert Rabang, were also disenrolled. Santana now lives in Lumi, the tribe where her mother is from. But she's not a member of Lumi either because she doesn't meet blood quantum requirements there. Blood quantum was imposed by the U.S. government in the early 1900s as a means to define and limit citizenship within Indian tribes. It's still being used today to measure the amount of tribal blood in a person's ancestry. Blood quantum isn't how we identify as indigenous. It's my connection to the land and the knowledge that I carry. It's not the amount of blood that I have in me, it's the fact that it's there and, and lives through me is all that matters to me. But so, I'm not enrolled anywhere. This neighborhood is where Santana grew up learning Nooksack traditions. Oh, my grandchildren. And since Robert is no longer considered Nooksack, he's also facing eviction. He's fighting to stay to preserve his mother's legacy, the woman who was known for weaving baskets out of cedar. It's been really stressful. It just hurts. All these people were our friends when we first came up here. Now they're all turning their backs like you. <sighs> Which, you know, it's really difficult. I don't want to give up my, uh, my mom's fight. I'm, I'm fighting for her. It could get really ugly because I'm not leaving here. I think there is a deeper concern and heartache, really, because now they might be losing their homes. They are perceiving the fact that they, because they are not able to enroll in Nooksack, that they have nothing, and that's not the case. They have options to housing, just like all people have options to housing. They just do not have options to housing with Nooksack. 
Rosemary says housing is hard to come by, and that's why they're pushing hard to make the Rebangs leave. She says about 60 people who are Nooksack await housing. Some are in this house that's now a homeless shelter. We're not saying that they don't belong anywhere else. We encourage them to find their lineage to where they do belong. For Robert, that means he'll likely move to Canada, where he already has a home. Santana's hopes is to join the Lumi tribe. Discussions to revise the Lumi tribe's basis for enrollment would mean she wouldn't have to prove the amount of blood she has, but rather her connection to the land. Our thanks to Maria. And still to come, the small town mayor stepping up to help his residents get to work and improve the community's air quality at the same time. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Take America's number one news with you anywhere you go, anytime, free. Download the ABC News app now. Breaking news, exclusives, 24 Seven. There for you with one touch. The ABC News app. Download it now. She was Diva. drama, money and fame, shop amazing, the prime housewife. Then suddenly, we've seen a lot of things on The Real Housewives, but we've never seen anyone be arrested. Unpredictable rich woman. Sign me up. Ready for a little GMA ish promo? Okay, here we go. GMA 7A every day with Robin, George, and Michael. That's how you start the day. Boom! America's number one news, ABC News. Most watched, most trusted, and streaming live to you anytime, anywhere, and free. This is ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news, free to you 24-7. Watch America's number one news whenever you want it, wherever you are, anytime. ABC News Live, streaming live and free on all platforms. Tonight in rural parts of the country, something as simple as getting to a doctor's appointment can be a challenge. In an area that also struggles with poor air quality, a small town mayor is doing his part to help people with their overall health and reduce the city's impact on air pollution. Reporter Jessica Harrington from KFSN in Fresno, California, has tonight's local lowdown. About 200 miles north of Los Angeles, California, surrounded by farmland, is the small town of Huron. The nearly 7,000 people who live there are predominantly farm workers with a median household income of $31,000 a year. Just off the town's main road, you'll find the Leap Institute headquarters, a nonprofit created by Huron's mayor, Ray Leon. I think uh, farm worker communities deserve the best. To give residents better access to critical services, such as doctor appointments, he created the free rideshare program, Green Raiteros. Raiteros comes from raite. Raite is a, a Spanglish term that comes from ride. It's the green raiteros because the fleet is made up of 100% electric vehicles which charge right next to the nonprofit's headquarters. As an environmental justice activist and advocate, Leon said it was important they use electric vehicles because the San Joaquin Valley has some of the nation's worst air quality. Experts say one of the main contributors to that pollution is large trucks that use Highway 99 and Interstate 5. Using electric vehicles also allows Leon the opportunity to apply for grants to help fund the program and keep the rides free for clients. The idea for the Green Rateros came in part from Leon's struggles as a child. He once needed to get to a hospitalized cousin and traveled the 52 miles north to Fresno by bus. I think it was 13 stops and it took us three hours to get there. He didn't want his community to have to struggle to get to essential services. So now, residents just have to register as a client, reserve a ride a few days in advance, and a driver will pick them up. That's what Jesus Contreras came in to do as we were speaking with the mayor. Tengo una cita en Baicelia. ¿Cuándo? El jueves. ¿De esta semana? Sí. He needed a ride to a doctor appointment about 50 miles away later that week. 
Gregorio Hernandez uses the service several times a week to get dialysis, which is about 20 miles away. His wife, Soledad Lemos, says the free rides are a lifeline. Para nosotros ha sido un gran apoyo. For us, it has been a huge support. Hernandez's doctor's appointments are anywhere from 20 to 60 miles away. Before the Green Reiteros, the trips were adding to their cost of health care. He has many appointments, and the fact is, before we were able to access the service, we were paying $60 to $80 a ride. Mayor Leon hopes the rideshare program will encourage other cities to see how beneficial going electric is for the environment and give his residents peace of mind to get to where they need to go. I think what we're doing is providing folks the experience on what it feels like to have, uh, to go from a, a, an individual owning a car to a community owning a fleet. Our thanks to Jessica for that story. That's our show for tonight. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Monaco Sarabdi. Thanks for streaming with us.